Hello, bonjour. Welcome to our presentation, Coup de pour Curivini, Helping Hands for Louisiana Creole. I'm Oliver Mayer, and this is my colleague, Nathan Wenty. Today, the main issue that we want to talk about is the relationship between the academic field of linguistics and the notion of community. So this is sort of a 10,000 feet up view of the traditional relationship that gets discussed here, which is that between individual linguists and the communities that they work with. This is, um, this is looking more at sort of the foundations of the, the interchanges that exist between these groups as collectives. And um, something Oliver and I have noticed in our training um, is that there's a shift within uh, university programs from promoting linguists as objective experts of language to that of the community engaged researcher that is balancing demands from the academe and the community. Nevertheless, there's still an expectation that community engaged researchers will step into positions of authority when it comes to linguistic issues. Um, and that there are still the same standards of productivity that a non community engaged researcher has regarding things like um, articles, monographs, etc. And those standards for those um, for those products are the same. But um, because community needs are both tangible, intangible, short term, long term, to truly meet those needs is at times at odds with the expectations of the academe. So to act with integrity in the community is not always going to be in step with academic expectations. And Oliver and I hope to illustrate that today with our experiences with the uh, speaker and learner community for Louisiana Creole. So we're going to introduce the language that we both work with, introduce ourselves in the context of our field work and our involvement with the revitalization, and talk about how these experiences can inform uh, a plan to better maintain the relationship between community and academe. So Louisiana Creole, also known as Curivini, is a French lexifier Creole spoken by far fewer than 10,000 people, mostly concentrated in South Louisiana, but also in diasporic populations elsewhere in the Gulf South, in Texas, notably where uh, Nathan did part of his fieldwork, and also in smaller populations, uh, for example, in California and Chicago. And uh, you'll notice that I gave two names for this language, and this neatly encapsulates uh, the issues that we're talking about here today. So the label Louisiana Creole is the one that you'll see if you read academic linguistic publications about the language, if you look at the dictionary uh, for the language, uh, which was compiled in the 90s. But Curivini is a label which has been increasingly used uh, by the revitalization movement, which is an online community of language activists who is seeking through this label to make Louisiana Creole distinct from French, alongside which uh, it has uh, always uh, been in, in the Louisiana linguistic ecology. So in our choice to include both of these labels in the title of our presentation, we're kind of giving a hint at some of the conflicts that we have between our role on the one side as linguists and on the other side as people involved in the revitalization and speaker communities for this language. For me personally, my involvement with this language and this community began um, towards the end of 2015. Uh, my research uh, ultimately ended up being a comparison of the <clears throat> ethno-linguistic community of Creoles in Texas and in Louisiana. Um, but when I began my field work, I was looking for a diasporic variety of Louisiana Creole, and I intended to sort of conduct st standard documentary linguistics on it. I wanted to do elicitations, translations, etc., and describe this variety. At about the same time, I joined the online revitalization movement both to familiarize myself with what I expected to be my field language and to hopefully leverage relationships within that online community to help find participants. Participant recruitment for me uh, turned out to be a linchpin of my research and a turning point. Um, I found participant recruitment to be very difficult because it was hard to build trust because this community was submerged in Texas. It was not readily evident. Uh, it was also self-selecting. I found that Creoles would put forward to me who they thought were the best representatives of what I was looking for, which was self-identified Creole-speaking Creoles. 
And the community was also inconsistent in their language ideologies, in the ways that they related their personal identity to the languages that they spoke and how they related those, um, the, both their language and their identity to other ethno-linguistic groups in their immediate environment. So I was ultimately pushed away from language documentation towards a more ethnographic and anthropologically focused dissertation that highlighted ethno-linguistic labeling practices for Gulf South Creoles in Texas and in Louisiana. Um, the decisions that I made here uh, sort of precluded me from particular areas of academic inquiry, which I will discuss later. And so, uh, like Nathan, I started with a fairly traditional language documentation and a corpus building project uh, in my PhD fieldwork. Unlike Nathan, I just stuck with that and uh, didn't adapt in, in this way to the, to the linguistic ecology on the ground. Um, but that was really a piece of research that I fell into in a way by accident and in a way into the academic career also by accident. My involvement in the Louisiana Creole language started just out of personal interest. So um, although you cannot tell that by my accent, my father is from Louisiana um, and I have a lot of family over there. And I just became interested as a teenager in this language in my heritage background. And I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to learn how to speak it. Um, and so I got involved in language revitalization. And uh, this has meant that when I'm doing field work, it's very much uh, a sense of returning to Louisiana, going back um, to somewhere which is part of my own identity and certainly where people feel that I have a home and a place as an insider in the community, which we'll discuss in a second. So in the context of the field, Oliver and I both had to decide how we were going to present ourselves to the community um, and then how we were going to react to the community's reception of us. Um, you know, our positionality ultimately being partially volitional and partially outside of our control. Uh, the first step of that is sort of looking at this traditional relationship that gets talked about a lot, and that is between us as individual linguists and the communities we were working with. Were we insiders? Were we outsiders? Um, as it turns out, both of us were somewhat liminal, but in different ways. From my perspective, because I learned how to speak the language varieties that were being used by Creoles, um, I was somewhat seen as a speaker, brought near. She secrets were sort of shared with me. But because I lacked a very important element of Creole ethno-linguistic identity, namely Gulf South origins, I was also seen as someone who was to be kept at arm's length. And this meant that I straddled a line between community member and non-community member that brought into sharp relief the, um, uh, the differences in the relationships that uh, my participants had conceived of between speakers of a language and members of a community. And so like Nathan, as, as a speaker of Creole, having learned the language for a while, by the time I went into the field for the first time, I was brought in. Um, but then I was brought in further by virtue of me having Louisiana heritage. And I was seen by many people, by most people I think that I've worked with in Louisiana as actually somebody who's a member of this uh, Creole Louisiana uh, community or cultural um, ethnic group, even though I myself never really felt comfortable identifying that strongly with that group. So this put me in an interesting and at times interpersonally difficult position of feeling, of course, very much um, at home and uh, a sense of return to a place of my heritage, but uh, at the same time, not wanting to go too far in how much of that heritage I can claim, uh, but being pulled by people from the community to claim more perhaps than I was comfortable in, in doing. A set of relationships that were, um, that were brought into focus for Oliver and I when we were doing our field work was this idea of the Creole community. Um, we're talking about it as if we can go objectively define it, but in reality, that's not the case. Uh, for me, I ended up recruiting participants based off of the criteria of self-identification as a Creole and as a Creole speaker. 
This meant that a lot of linguistic variety was sort of permitted under the Creole umbrella that I was working under. Um, whereas from Oliver's perspective, well, for me, it was very much this uh, more traditional linguistic approach where I had a clear set of morphosyntactic criteria, which is said, this is Creole, um, anything outside of these criteria is French and therefore out of my uh, research purview. Um, and so this uh, was something that, that meant I, I didn't get to experience in, in the data that I collected the full linguistic repertoire of the community which identifies itself as Creole. And this also uh, bore out in, in a different way for participant recruitment that I sort of alluded to, which was this idea of community curated contacts where um, people who might have met my two participant um, criteria, they would put forward for me who they thought was the best representative of their community. And that meant that the sample that I got was not objectively representative, but on the other hand, I was honoring the community's desire to sort of put their best, their best foot forward, what they felt was the most representative member of their community, knowing that it was going to be shared with the outside world to some extent. So um, this all just sort of speaks to uh, where is the community, who is the community, and ultimately, who gets to define it? What set of relationships takes precedence? This was also found when we uh, noticed that there were communities that would call themselves and their uh, speech varieties Creole who would not recognize one another. So there were sort of fields within the field and um, again, made it difficult to talk about the Creole community in, in holistic um, homogenized terms and uh, really raises the question of how quick should we be to talk about community um, without sort of interrogating the internal diversity that exists within these communities? Absolutely. And one of the important branches of the Creole community um, uh, is the revitalization movement, but because it exists wholly online, there's an issue of how that relates um, and what the historical continuity is to the places where we did field work. Now, when I got involved in the revitalization community, as I mentioned, I was very young. Um, I was there to learn the language, to learn about the language, to participate. And then over the years, as I became more interested in academic work, I started to understand that I could also be observing this community and if you like studying what was going on inside of it. And so I felt this tension between participant and observer. Um, and that was very much the case for you too, Nathan. Yeah, because I was simultaneously involved in learning the language through the revitalization movement and doing field work with um, mother tongue speakers of the language, uh, I, I was at the same time using the revitalization movement for the purposes of my field work, but also learning right alongside people um, in the same ways that they were and developing attachments to the language and to the community and forging real relationships that made the boundary between participant and observer very difficult to define. Right, and um, this is similar to the experience that I had had, right, you know, over the course of my involvement in the online community where I joined really as an interested person. I became invited to contribute to projects, language activist projects, and I've been in the community for so long that the boundaries between people who I'm sort of working with or traditionally a, a linguist would be studying the community. I mean, these people are my friends. So the boundary between uh, me as a linguist, me as a language activist, and me uh, relating to people as fellow activists or people that I'm studying, it's all very fuzzy. Um, and I was invited, for example, to contribute to uh, the creation of an orthography um, for the language as a consultant linguist. Uh, but really my role there was not to provide linguistic expertise, but rather to help package this orthography in a way that was acceptable by academic linguistics standards as perceived by the community. And this idea of, um, this idea of, of being a linguist, but being sort of the community's linguist, uh, contrasts with my own um, experiences where when I would try to sort of present 
information as a linguist pertaining to perhaps variation within the language um, is not always met with uh, with <laughs> with warmth. Um, it was seen as somewhat suspect, not only because uh, it may be going against the um, the essentializing and standardizing forces of the revitalization movement, but also because of my tenuous relationship with the community because of the lack of this very important cornerstone of ancestry with the community. And so uh, there are times where there's been something I wanted to share with the revitalization community pertaining to variation or historical multilingual multilectal uh, uh, behaviors within the Gulf South Creole community. And I've asked Oliver to float those ideas or those suggestions, because I know that he's going to be accorded a different kind of grace than I will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide was this kind of disconnect between the online revitalization community and then the places where Nathan and I have done fieldwork um, in historically uh, Creolophone communities uh, uh, in Louisiana, in Texas, in Nathan's case as well. Um, and there is this disconnect between uh, old and new speakers and disconnect is the right word because it's also a matter sometimes just of internet access. People in, in a town in Louisiana where they grew up speaking Creole just don't know that there's all of this online activity for the language. And Nathan and I have often, I feel, been caught as a kind of interme intermediary uh, between these two groups of people who really, for the sake of the revitalization movement, do need to communicate with each other. Um, and one place where this came to the fore was in uh, our work with Codefil, which is a state uh, organization for uh, the promotion of French in Louisiana, the Council uh, for Development of French in Louisiana. Um, so in 2017, uh, I was asked to join the Creole Committee of Codefil. This is the first time that Codefil as a state organization had paid much attention to Creole, although it falls within its remit, um, Codefil has been involved in promoting primarily French, actually mostly totally French and through French immersion programs. Uh, in the Creole committee, they wanted to discuss creating Creole immersion programs. And I was asked as an expert to come in from the outside. Of course, this was very uncomfortable for me for many reasons, uh, not only considering I was just a PhD student at the time, I also didn't consider myself a legitimate representative of the Creole community. And when I went to the meeting, uh, I realized that actually there was only one person at the table who had grown up speaking Creole and who really had a claim to being a Creole speaker. Uh, so that put me um, in a difficult position. And uh, eventually, um, because of Oliver's short-term stay in the US, uh, he asked me to, to step into that same expert role, which I uncomfortably accepted, much in the same way that he originally uncomfortably accepted. And, um, noticed something else troubling within these Creole committee meetings, which was that there seemed to be a lot of confusion over exactly what Louisiana Creole was um, as a language. Um, there was this notion that, well, since there are no Louisiana Creole didactic materials, we can easily substitute those for Haitian Creole, Martinican Creole, Guadalupe Creole, um, without any real hiccups. Um, and I sort of raised the alarm bell for that and said, I, I don't think that you realize that just because Haitian Creole and Louisiana Creole share that word Creole at the end of the name, they are not the same language. Um, ultimately, this pushed me and the other Creole member of the Creole committee, Herbert Wiltz, uh, in collaboration with Oliver to create some didactic materials, but we'll talk about that um, on the next slide. Oliver and I have also been asked to uh, informally appear and uh, for cultural events or um, through different kinds of interviews to be experts on this language that we have always felt uncomfortable doing because we don't have the kind of legitimate claim to the language that a native speaker would have. Um, this also came to the fore for me because I was approached twice by the Alliance Francaise of Lafayette to teach uh, Louisiana Creole in a classroom setting. And on the one hand, I felt a responsibility to share my knowledge as a speaker um, with others, but
But when I actually got to the classes, I found that not only were I, what was I talking to students who came from historically Creole speaking communities, but in some cases I was teaching Creole speakers who simply felt that they were rusty. And I did not feel like this relationship, this disproportionate power relationship between teacher and student was necessarily the best way or the right way to share this information with others. As I mentioned, uh, this uh, conflict within Codafield pushed us to create some didactic materials. Uh, Herb, Oliver, and I, we created something called the Tea Leave Creole, and we quickly put it together and gave it to the committee and said, here quick before the school year starts, don't say there are no materials for Louisiana Creole, they're here. Uh, as part of a, re uh, as a result of the, the uh, time crunch that we were under, this PDF had some shortcomings. It was fairly unpolished. Um, we included variation without explicitly commenting on it. And it lacked cultural context, which a lot of learners had expressed that they wanted in their language learning materials. So we sought to remedy these things with a second edition uh, of the book for which we got funding from the Foundation for Endangered Languages. Um, and we were really keen to have this put together with a uh, graphic design. We had a graphic designer, Irina Wan, and we also had uh, an illustrator, Jonathan Myers, from the community, uh, the online revitalization community, to give it a real look and feel as a professional product, because we recognized, we understood that there was a real need for such a book and for valorization of the language through such a book coming from the community. And this was something that was coming both from the online revitalization community and the uh, traditional uh, offline community, if you like. And so we collaborated not only with Herbert Wills, the long-standing language activist who was able to um, show our work and, and get feedback on our work from the uh, historically Creole speaking community. But we also worked with Adrian Gilly Chapman, who's a, a long-standing language activist in the online community, a learner herself, a teacher herself, and by day also a teacher and educator in school. So she was able to help us understand the needs of learners um, relative to what we wanted to produce. Um, and this was really important because it, it helped us straddle this very difficult um, line which was that we recognized that there was a need for a reference book and the community was really clamoring for some kind of introduction to the language, some kind of guide to the language. But we were very reluctant to produce a reference book because from an academic standpoint, we knew that we just simply wouldn't be able to put in all of the information we would want in the way that we were trained as linguists. So ultimately, Oliver and I look at our interactions with the Creole community as coup de main. And coup de main is a culturally specific form of mutual aid where an individual um, seeks the help of other individuals to come perform work on an individual homestead that would be too great for one person to accomplish by themselves. And what's important about coup de main is it is help from within a community. Oliver and I both on different occasions have prioritized our affiliation with the Creole community over our academic affiliation. Um, and that sometimes uh, precluded us from certain academic opportunities. Um, one thing that we uh, strive to do in this, uh, from this perspective is democratize our resources. So insofar as we are producing things like conference presentations, articles, we do our best to make these available and discoverable online. But we also seek to find equitable exchanges between the academe and the community. That means that whereas uh, an academic who works with a community, a linguist who works with a community might be expected to produce a dissertation, a monograph, and a series of articles while giving the community a picture dictionary, we wanted to make sure that, the, um, that they were getting things of comparable value. And sometimes this doesn't just mean making the academic resources accessible to the community, it means modifying them to the needs of the community. An example of that is the Tea Leave Creole, because although there are descriptive grammars for Louisiana Creole, they are not created with the learner in mind. And so the Tea Leave Creole fills that gap. Another example is uh, for my own dissertation, I took that those findings and put them into a self-published book that cuts away the dross of a dissertation as a genre 
and presents the information in a much clearer format without skimping on the details of it. This is not a publication that I was able to get a publisher for. I self-published it because the need for the community to have the information in an accessible format outweighed, for me, the academic imperative of publishing something like a book. Right, and I think that that example um, of your book, Nathan, brings us to, to the conclusion of our presentation, where what we really want to argue based on our experience that we've described here is that the kind of work um, that Nathan's describing, where you're producing something which is really um, community facing, um, but is a form of democratized research, and all the kinds of uh, collaborations with the community that we've been describing, all of this kind of work, this is a real skill. It's something that you have to work on. It certainly, I found it very difficult, and you have to develop this over several years to understand how to do this. It's a form of expertise, though, which is not validated by academia. This is something which we think needs to change. Um, and if this can change, in other words, if we can really validate this stance of the community engaged researcher, not just in an abstract sense as something that's good to do, but in something which can be, uh, be a, a, a place for academic output to, to grow that's also community facing. Um, this will allow a kind of reconciliation of this split loyalty that I think linguists find uh, themselves in where on one hand they want to contribute to the community but on the other hand they have to manage their academic career and it's really only by repairing that split loyalty um, through validation of this kind of work and this kind of perspective that we can repair uh, the relationship between linguistics as a discipline and the community as, a, as an abstract entity. So thank you very much, merci. And we look forward to seeing you in the Q&A session.